Greetings, everyone. My name is Mark Nutter. I'm the Conservation Director at Program Director at New Hampshire Audubon. Thank you so much for deciding to spend some time with us this evening. I would first like to acknowledge that I'm talking to you near our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the ancient village of Penacook in Nadakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach, or human beings, who have stewarded Nadakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can see and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to more educational resources. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the eye-opening resources available at indigenousnh.com, including this particular story map, which details the history of the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki people, specifically here in New Hampshire. These resources, among others, have helped me re recognize the ongoing consequences of colonialism for all people of color and the need for change in our current society. Thank you so much for your interest in tonight's topic. Garden for Wildlife, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife with David Mizajewski from the National Wildlife Federation. To note, New Hampshire Audubon is actually the state affiliate of the NWF, and we thank David for his time this evening. As you may know, this evening's talk is the fifth uh, session in our 12-month-long speaker series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World the past recordings of which you can find on our YouTube page and the program page. Throughout this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and the humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with the natural world and the importance of conservation action. This particular talk this evening kicks off the first of seven pollinator conservation themed presentations. These pollinator experts and community scientists are presenting on topics such as native bees, beneficial predatory wasps, nocturnal pollinators, and the native shrubs and trees the pollinators need to survive. However, before I hand it over to David for tonight's presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits within the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that's completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. Connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars like these. Researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds. Managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation. And finally, advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am here today because of donors and members like you. We also have a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you're a volunteer, member, or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our mission without you. If you would like to become a part of our conservation family, which I hope you will, please check out our website for ways to get involved. We are super impressed with the turnout for this evening, so much so that we had to upgrade our Zoom webinar account just this afternoon to accommodate the 230 registered attendees. And we're also streaming this live on Facebook to accommodate the nearly 2,000 people who were interested in learning alongside us this evening. For those of you in the Zoom webinar, please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, and reflections you might have. Um, in fact, for fun, just type into the chat where you're watching this from. It's been so great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. And so that others may engage with you, change where you're sending the chat to all panelists and attendee, attendees. Who knows, maybe you'll, you'll meet someone that's right down your street. Um, and tonight we're gonna be using the Q&A button for any specific questions as they arise. So I've set the parameters to allow uh, other attendees to view the questions so they can comment on the questions and upvote the questions that they too want answered. I imagine that we will have a lot more questions than we have time for. 
So this upvoting will help us hone the questions uh, for David. And um, just to know, I'll also be doing my best to monitor the Facebook Live chat and kind of funneling some of those into the Q&A. Um, but we also can uh, answer questions in the next coming days, if, as long as there are comments on that video. So without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. David Mizajewski has been fascinated by our natural world for as long as he can remember. A lifelong naturalist, he spent his outdoors exploring the woods, fields, and wetlands, observing and learning about the surprising diversity of wildlife that inhabit them. David is a naturalist and television host with the National Wildlife Federation. He holds a, holds a degree in human and natural ecology from Emory University and is an expert on wildlife and our environment. He is dedicated to using his knowledge and enthusiasm to help others understand and protect wildlife. David regularly appears in the media to promote wildlife conservation. He hosted and co-produced Backyard Habitat, a television series on Animal Planet that showed people how to transform their yards into gardens and gardens into thriving habitats for birds and other local wildlife. He appeared in the Animal Planet miniseries, Spring Watch USA, that looked at the effect seasonal change has on wildlife from salamanders and flying squirrels to great horned owls and black bears. He's appeared on Nat Geo Wild on series such as Are You Smarter Than, How Human Are You, Are, and Unlikely Animal Friends, and co-hosted the network's primetime series tele, uh, Pet Talk. David is a regular guest on NBC's Today Show, Conan, The Wendy Williams Show, Hallmark Home and Family, Access Hollywood, Inside Edition, Build Series, NYC, and Good Day. Oh my goodness. With a resume like that, please give a warm webinar welcome to David. Thank you, Mark. I am so excited to be here. I love this topic, this whole idea of gardening for wildlife. I'm thrilled to be here with New Hampshire Audubon. Um, I, you know, I love giving this talk, but I love giving it even more to National Wildlife Federation affiliates. So I'm uh, really excited. So I'm gonna dive right in folks. I have a lot to cover. And I'm gonna, you know, power through all this. You know, we'll do our best to answer as many questions at the end, like Mark said. But you know, if we don't get to your question, uh, a really great way to get an answer to them is to just uh, go back to the Facebook Live because the video will be there, and I'll do my best to go back in. Maybe not later tonight, but probably tomorrow and over the course of the next couple of days, and try to answer any questions that we didn't get to here. So, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get the show started. All right, so um, my talk is called Garden for Wildlife, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. Again, my name is naturalist David Mizajewski. Mark just read to you, uh, you know, a good chunk of my bio. So um, just suffice to say, I'm a naturalist, I'm a lifelong nature lover, and my job at the National Wildlife Federation is similar to naturalists that work at national parks or zoos or you know other places like that i just tend to do my work interpreting the natural world via the media so that's where all the tv stuff comes in and i do tons of radio and podcasting and i just launched a youtube channel so if you're interested in watching some of my videos there in fact i just launched one um, just on saturday called my five tips to garden for wildlife. So that's something to check out too. If you can spell my name and it's on the screen right there for you, you can just search me out um, all over social media as well. And I'd love it if you followed me on all, all those places. It's a great way again to follow up, get questions answered. I try to make myself really available. So let's start tonight's talk by just, um, I wanna introduce you to the National Wildlife Federation. We're a national nonprofit conservation organization. We're one of the oldest and largest in the US. And we do focus our work here in the US or North America broadly. That's something that kind of sets us apart um, on the national scene in terms of conservation organizations, many of which have more of an international focus. So I like to think of us as America's conservation organization. And this is our mission, to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. And it's probably not a surprise that we human beings are the major cause for a lot of that rapid change and that it's really not very good news for wildlife. Um, I promise this talk is gonna hopefully be inspiring to you. At, at a minimum, it's gonna be positive. 
Um, but I do want to start out with just some of the realities of the world that, that we are facing right now in terms of wildlife. We really truly are in a wildlife extinction crisis on this planet, and it's largely caused by, by humans and our actions and how we've altered the natural world. You know, right here in the U.S., well, people don't realize that though globally there's about a million species endangered with extinction. Here in the U.S., we've got over 1,600 that are listed as endangered, and there's about 12,000 species that wildlife biologists and wildlife managers across the states have identified as in decline and in need of conservation help. Now, these are not counted among that 1,600 endangered species that we already have. That's fully one third of our wildlife here in North America is at increased risk of extinction in the coming decades. Recent studies have looked at the North American bird population, which has lost about 3 billion birds in just the last 50 or so years. There's 3 billion less birds here in North America today than there were in, in 1970. The monarch butterfly population continues to crash. We're gonna talk about that. Bees are disappearing. So, you know, unfortunately the news is really not that good for a lot of species, but this whole idea of gardening for wildlife and, and urban ecology and restoring habitat where people live is a way that we can all get involved. And that's what tonight's talk is really gonna be about. But you know, as far as the National Wildlife Federation goes, you know, we work in a wide variety of ways, just actually like New Hampshire Audubon does in very similar ways. And so you know, we're working to you know, fight for strong endangered species protection laws and other legislation, um, things that brought back birds like this, the American Eagle, uh, bald eagle, which was almost extinct, but because of the protections of the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we were able to recover them. And back in 2007, they were officially delisted. Um, you know, today the National Wildlife Federation is focusing on, for example, reintroducing bison to their native grassland habitat, to building highway overpasses out in California so that the endangered or the declining mountain lion population there and other wildlife can navigate the landscape without getting run over and all the busy roads in the Los Angeles ecosystem. Um, we're working back um, in, in, in the east in New Hampshire with our New Hampshire, I'm sorry, with North Carolina, with our North Carolina affiliate to protect critically endangered red wolves. Um, so a lot of work like that. And, and you'll notice that a lot of those species that I just mentioned that are the benefit of some of this work that we're doing are mammals. They're big and furry and charismatic or bald eagles, you know, feathered. And that's what we typically think of when we think of wildlife, right? We think of those kinds of animals, but this is wildlife too. This is that monarch butterfly that I was just mentioning. And you know, the reality is, is that insects are wildlife. People tend to not think of them as such. Again, we think of mammals and birds usually, and there may be reptiles and amphibians, but you know, we, we generally don't think of insects as wildlife, but they're animals and you know, they're not plants. And so, um, and they happen to be a group of wildlife that number one are particularly important for our ecosystems, but they are also you know, the, a group of wildlife that can particularly benefit by how we choose to maintain our, you know, our yards, our gardens, our neighborhoods. And so that's kind of a key point here in this whole idea of garden for wildlife. Now, the National Wildlife Federation has been working in this space, this idea of restoring habitat in the places where, like we like to say, where people live, work, play, and worship, right? The human landscape, right? Our cities, our towns, our neighborhoods, as opposed to sort of more wild areas or wilderness areas that have a little bit less of a human footprint. So this Garden for Wildlife program has been around since 1973, and it was originally started, you know, simply as a way to maybe restore a little bit of the habitat that was rapidly disappearing as we, you know, at that point in time, we're, we're, we're and still are today, frankly, you know, rapidly kind of uh, sprawling, you know, in our development, you know, taking the old woods and the farm fields and turning them into housing developments and strip malls and, you know, highways and pavement and lawns that don't really support anything. And so the idea behind this concept of gardening for wildlife was that let's engage, you know, just the average citizen, citizen in wildlife conservation and help them, inspire them, teach them on how they can make their own piece of the earth, their own yards or garden spaces, reconnected to that local ecosystem and maybe repair a little bit of the damage that that we've done just by developing and polluting and things like that and so it's about helping you know the those all those declining wildlife species that i mentioned it's also about helping to keep some of our common species common you know common species will only remain common if they continue to have habitat resources and so this idea of gardening for wildlife and creating these habitat gardens is is at the core of that at the same time this is a program that, the, that we came up with at the National Wildlife Federation to give people 
a, a daily place where they could get that dose of nature that we all so desperately want and need. And you know, you don't have to go off into the wilderness somewhere to, to have a, a connection to nature or to see wildlife. You know, if you create a wildlife habitat garden, you literally just have to walk outside your door and you know, get all those great benefits, the recharging of your spirit and the joy that comes with being able to observe, to observe wildlife. So that's kind of the core two concepts about what Garden for Wildlife is all about. And we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through in this talk exactly the, the things that you need to do in your own space to make it wildlife friendly. But before we get to that, I wanna kind of address something of an elephant in the room. And that is a lot of times people are very, confused as to what a wildlife conservation group you know, is doing having a gardening program because conventional gardening would teach you that you don't want wildlife anywhere near your garden, right? Wildlife destroys your garden. Well, here's why. It's because plants are the foundation of wildlife habitat, no matter where you go. That's true out in the wilderness areas. It's also true in your own yards or garden spaces. And you, know, you can't really have healthy wildlife populations unless you have good, healthy plant populations. And, you know, if those plants are at the bottom of the ecosystem of the food web, the next level up are those insects, you know, again, important wildlife in and of themselves, but also because they are part of the food web, a critical piece of the food web. And if you look at insects, the insects that, that rely on plants to complete some part of their life cycle, 90% of them plus can only survive using the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. And that brings us to the concept of native plants. Now, many of you might have heard this term or be familiar with it, but I think it's important to kind of just define what we're talking about. So what's a native plant? A native plant is just a plant that grows naturally in your region. Now in North America, we've got a few dozen eco regions and they all have sort of different plant palettes. And so the idea is that these are the plants that over you know, centuries, thousands of years, millions of years are kind of in tune with your local conditions. And that includes wildlife. Now, when it comes to using these native plants in, in a garden scenario um, or a landscape, they're great choices because they're adapted to the local conditions. You know, assuming you, you know you practice good garden, um, just good gardening. You know, sort of right plant, right place. Um, if you if you're planting the right natives in their right location, they're pretty they're pretty uh, you know sort of low maintenance in a garden scenario because they are adapted to the local soils and the climate and the precipitation and all of those other things. So you almost never would ever need to fertilize them or you know, spray pesticides on them or do anything fussy with them once they get established. The other thing that's great about them, of course, is that they're the plants that wildlife need to survive. Without native plant communities, we can't have wildlife. It's just as simple as that. And so to illustrate that, um, this is coming from a study from a, a, a gentleman named Dr. Doug Tallamy. Some of you might be familiar with his work. He's a great partner with us at National Wildlife Federation, and he's one of the, the scientists that are really looking at this question, into this question of, of the importance of native plants on wildlife populations in the sort of that human dominated landscape. And so Dr. Tallamy has done a bunch of research on this, you know, looking at, for example, caterpillar host plants, you know, so all species of butterflies and moths start out as caterpillars and caterpillars have to feed on the foliage of plants. Now plants don't want their foliage eaten. So uh, in this, there's sort of this evolutionary arms race where the plants produce toxins that either make them taste bad or might outright kill any insects that try to eat them. So the, the, the butterflies and moths have, you know, sort of in that, that arms race have figured out, have, have evolved an immunity to some of those plant toxins but they can't be immune to everything. So what they've done is that they've specialized in, in sort of immunity or tolerance to certain toxins, which means that they can only feed on the plants that they have that immunity, right? And so we call those specific plants the caterpillar host plants for that species. And every species of butterfly and moth has a different set of, of caterpillar host plants. And again, without that caterpillar host plant in the landscape, that species of butterfly or moth cannot complete its life cycle and their populations decline. So, Looking at our native oaks, the oaks belong to the genus Quercus. Collectively, the native oaks in North America serve as the caterpillar host plant for 557 species of butterflies and moths. Compare that to something like a ginkgo. Now ginkgos, you know, they used to be native here in North America. They're an ancient species, but they went extinct here like millions of years ago. Um, they exist in other parts of the world. They're now cultivated and are a commonly planted street tree in many cities. They are also planted ornamentally. 
And yet they've lost those ecological connections over that, that sort of long time that they went extinct here. And so today, ginkgo support zero species of butterflies and moths. So you begin to see, just with this one simple example, but replicate this for most non-native plants, which by the way, make up the majority of plants that we plant in our yards. You know, and when you think about the impact that you know, planting our natives and the volume of insects that they could support versus non-natives, you, you start to begin to see how some of the, the pieces of that food web have been, you know, the strings have been cut. And, and you also begin to see the power of your plants. You know, one plant choice can make a big difference in terms of the quality of a habitat, even on a small scale like, like most of our yards. So here's what it boils down to, is that wildlife need plants to survive, and specifically, they need native plants. Now, the act of planting something for a purpose, well, that's the definition of gardening, right? So if you plant tomatoes and eggplants and, and squash because you like to eat them, you kind of would probably consider yourself a vegetable gardener. Well, if you're planting native plants to restore habitat for local wildlife, birds, bees, butterflies, and, and such, well, that makes you a wildlife gardener. And that is why a wildlife conservation group like the National Wildlife Federation has a garden program, because it's all about those connections between plants and animals. Now, let's talk quickly about what we mean by wildlife. Now, everybody loves birds and butterflies. These are the, the kinds of animals that most people probably are interested in, you know, that piqued your interest to kind of come to this talk tonight. That's why I called it attracting birds, butterflies, and other backyard wildlife. Because if I called it, you know, attracting, I don't know, slugs and wasps, you probably wouldn't. But, um, but at any rate, you know, th these are, you know, easy to love animals. But the cool thing is that when you create a, a garden habitat that's going to support butterflies, hummingbirds, and songbirds, you're also gonna be supporting all sorts of other cool animals. And I think, you know, butterflies kind of hog all the attention when it comes to beautiful and interesting insects, but the insect world is incredibly diverse. And most people kind of get weirded out or freaked out by bugs, but they're so cool. I mean, look at this beautiful damselfly. So gorgeous, right? I mean, as beautiful as any butterfly. And this is a, you know, an animal that could be supported by the same things that you're doing in your yard or your garden space to support the birds and the butterflies. Similarly, amphibians like this green tree frog are declining globally faster than any other group of vertebrate wildlife. You know, like a full third of amphibian species are endangered with extinction. And it's, I just think it's really cool, the idea that if you, you, know, you plant your bird garden and animals like the, the tree frogs are actually benefiting and being supported by your habitat garden on the local level. So all sorts of wildlife are gonna benefit and be able to utilize your wildlife habitat garden, even if at the outset, you're just trying to attract birds and butterflies. Now. That means that sometimes animals that might frighten us are also gonna be supported and also present in your wildlife habitat garden. So I want everybody to just take a quick deep breath looking at this picture of a snake and a wasp. It's okay if you encounter these animals in your landscape. First, snakes, for example. Almost all snake species are 100% harmless to people. I'm gonna say that again, almost all snake species are 100% harmless to people. Now in New Hampshire, you only have one venomous species of snake, the timber rattlesnake, and they're extremely rare. So for folks in New Hampshire, like you, you have nothing to worry about from any snake that's gonna show up in your yard. Like this garter snake here, again, completely harmless. They're eating things like earthworms and slugs and frogs and fish, not gonna hurt a person. In fact, they're terrified of us. They're gonna do everything in their power to get away from us. So, you know, if you happen to encounter one in your yard, yes, it might be a little scary, especially if you have a snake phobia, but it's okay. You don't have to reach for the shovel and bash it on the head. And, you know, I still hear people say, the only good snake is a dead snake. And that's just, you know, that's just, you know, hogwash, frankly. I mean, it just is so, it's so divorced from reality of the actual danger that these animals pose to us, especially when you factor in their benefit as, predators. You know, many snakes are eating rodents and helping to keep their populations under control. So we really want them around. And if they show up in your garden, that's a good thing. Same thing with wasps. This is a great golden digger wasp, a really common species all across the country. And it's nothing to be worried about. You know, these are not social wasps. They don't form hives. They're not aggressive, but they are like their bee descendants because bees actually evolved from wasps like their bee descendants, they're pollinators. This great golden digger wasp there is on a milkweed plant gathering nectar and, and in the process pollinating that flower. So that's an important ecological service that these wasps are providing for us. At the same time, unlike bees, which are essentially herbivores or vegetarian, they only eat flower nectar and pollen, wasps 
are mostly, most species are predatory in, in at least for part of their diet or parasitic. So they're actually tirelessly patrolling your yard, taking care of the actual insect pests, right? So you want them around, you know, just their presence doesn't mean that you need to panic or try to get rid of them. You know, again, even if all you really care about are the birds and the butterflies. So just try to practice some tolerance with some of these other groups of wildlife, because for the most part, they're harmless and they're also really important. Now, animals that might be a nuisance in the garden or the landscape might show up too. And if you want to deter things like deer or try to discourage raccoons, that's totally fine. You know, I, I wanted to address this because a big part of this garden for wildlife movement at the National Wildlife Federation is not necessarily saying that, you know, your yard needs to be like Noah's Ark for every living creature out there, but that it's also about avoiding conflicts with wildlife. And usually when we have situations like that, a few behavior changes on our part can go a long way. So, you know, raccoons are getting into your trash can. Well, store your trash inside until the, the morning of pickup. Put a, uh, a lid on it that you can snap shut or keep tight with bungee cords and problem solved as far as the raccoons go. You know, if you wanna put up deer fencing to keep the deer out, that's totally fine. The white-tailed deer are doing just fine. They don't need our help and in fact, there are actually, uh, there's so many deer in so many places that they're eating a lot of the native plant community that other wildlife rely on. So again, if you wanna deter some wildlife in your wildlife habitat garden, that's totally fine. And just like with, um, you know, the, the scary animals, you know, predators are gonna show up. And you know what that means? It means you've done this successfully. It means you've built a food web, right? You've built out those low, lower levels and the, the, the predatory wildlife are gonna show up because you've given them a good habitat. Um, and so, you know, I'm not talking about attracting black bears. Um, that's probably, the, you know, the biggest predator that you have in, in, in New Hampshire, which are really omnivores. But, um, you know, in other parts of the country, you know, people might get other kinds of bears or uh, mountain lions or things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about suburban level um, or even urban predators. So things like red fox. You know, people see these animals and they think, oh my gosh, that's a danger to my pets or my kids. The average weight of an adult male red fox is about 15 pounds. These animals are not much bigger than your pet cat. They just have longer legs and big fluffy tails, so they look a lot bigger. They're eating insects and fruit and grazing on grass and eating rodents and, and small animals like that. So, you know, I just want to emphasize this because predators, you know, have a, we have a long history of wiping predators out and kind of treating predators like villains because they kill to survive. Um, that's kind of anthropomorphizing them and, and attributing human um, kind of motivations to them. And they must be evil because they have to kill. But no, they're just doing their normal thing. And they play a role in the ecosystem, including your sort of backyard habitat ecosystem. And I included that picture of the roadrunner, just in case anybody just was not buying what I was saying about snakes and, you know, wanted to yeah, see a snake get 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 it its right, and so um, and I'll note too that you'll see animals from all around the country. I give this presentation all over the U.S., and so you know you'll see some species that aren't found in New Hampshire, like the Roadrunner. But if I was giving this talk in, um, in in Arizona, it would be a little bit more applicable. But at any rate, predators are important. You want them. That means the ecosystem is healthy and that you have a functioning uh, web. And again, just the presence of these animals doesn't mean you know, that there's any cause for alarm or panic or that you need to call somebody to come, you know, deal with it or get rid of it. I would say just take a deep breath, take a step back, enjoy a really cool wildlife sighting and let that animal go about its business. And lastly, in the wildlife garden, it's, it's about people too. Like I mentioned, wildlife habitat gardens are a place where you can just get connected to nature, you know, go outside, smell the flowers, hear the bird song. People of all ages can really benefit from that, that sort of daily dose of nature, daily dose of outdoor time. So make sure when you're building your wildlife habitat garden, you make a little habitat for people too. This is actually in my backyard. I, I live in New Jersey, just out of, uh, outside of New York City. And, you know, I sit out there all the time. I have my coffee in the morning, pour a glass of wine in the evening and just soak it all in. And that's a really key part of all this is enjoying the nature that you have supported and created. All right, so let's get into the nuts and the bolts here of what it takes to create a wildlife habitat garden. All wildlife species need four things to survive. And this is true, you know, both in your yard or your garden space, as well as out in the wilderness. And they're food, water, cover, and places for the wildlife to reproduce, raise their young, that kind of thing. I'm gonna do a deep dive on each one of these things. But if you provide those four things in your habitat and you commit to maintaining your yard in a kind of a natural way that is we consider sustainable, those are the five things that will earn you certified wildlife habitat status for your garden space. I'm gonna to talk to you, uh, tell you exactly how to do that at the end, but 
May is Garden for Wildlife Month. We celebrate this program um, all, all year long, but in May, we really try to promote it. And we do have a, a couple of promotions going on to get people, you know, more people involved certifying. So um, I'll tell you what the certification, again, what you need to do as we finish going through this, but, and I'll flash this slide again at the end, but if you want to just jot this down, we are doing a promotion where we're like discounting our signs, which we do sell as a nonprofit. This is one of the ways that we, you know, raise funds to do our work. So, um, but we are offering a, a, some, some cool discounts. So just um, note this website, nwf.org slash certify and garden, uh, the promo code garden 21. And again, I'll show this slide at the very end. All right, so let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about providing food for wildlife. Probably the first thing people think about when you talk about kind of feeding the wildlife in, in a backyard scenario is putting out a bird feeder. And you know, there's nothing wrong with bird feeders, but here's the thing. Bird feeders are not habitat. They're really kind of an extra, an add-on, a supplement. And that's because studies show that birds really only use feeders as a supplement to the natural foods that they're finding out in the landscape. So, you know, they're not relying solely on feeders. And the good thing about that is that, you know, they, they don't become reliant on feeders. And so if your feeder goes dry or empty, or you have to go on vacation and you can't refill it or whatever, like the birds are not going to starve to death. They're going to find their natural foods, assuming that they're out there in the landscape, which is why you should really be focusing first and foremost, if you want to feed the birds, feed with your plants. Mother Nature feeds with plants, and that's how you should be thinking about it as, you know, first and foremost, your first way of providing natural sources of food for the birds and other wildlife. So how do plants feed wildlife? Well, we have a couple cedar waxwings here gobbling up berries from a winter berry holly. So berries, you know, we like to eat them, the wildlife like to eat them. So berries are one way that your plants can provide food for wildlife. Another way, if you take a look at the, uh, the goldfinch over there on the sunflower, are seeds. That, that bird is eating seeds from that flower head. So seeds are a way that your plants are going to provide food for wildlife. The squirrel there in the middle is, is also eating seeds found within a cone. You know, cones of our conifers are you know, filled with little seeds and so are nuts that are in there. And so that's a food source. Nuts themselves, you know, acorns and beech nuts and things like that. That's an important food source. So berries, fruits, seeds, nuts, cones. These are all ways that your plants are going to provide natural food sources for the wildlife. Other wildlife feed on things like flower nectar, butterflies and bees, for example, like these two right here. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, flower nectar is sugar water and sugar is filled with calories. And these are species of wildlife that have evolved to feed on that sugar water as their primary food source. So, you know, plant a lot of beautiful blooming native plants and you'll be providing food for these kinds of animals. And you know what's bad about that, right? Um, so bees and butterflies, hummingbirds, and, maw and, and uh, moths also are nectar feeders. And I specifically chose this moth because it's called a hummingbird moth. And uh, you can see why it looks you know, pretty similar to, to the actual bird. And I want to give a shout out to moths just for a second here, because again, butterflies do hog up all that attention of cool insects um, and that people want to, to attract. But Moths are pretty cool in and of themselves, even though they're, they're not maybe as pretty uh, as, as, as butterflies. Some moth species are like this, this hummingbird moth that's pretty colorful and also flies during the day. But moths probably ecologically are more important than butterflies. So butterflies evolved from moths, just like bees evolved from wasps. And you can kind of think of butterflies as, as day flying moths. But just by sheer numbers, moths are more important because there's more of them out there pollinating plants and also producing caterpillars, which we're gonna get to in a minute, but are a very important food source in and of themselves. So I wanna give moths a little bit of love there. But yeah, the butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, moths, these are all animals that feed on flower nectar. Other ways your plants are gonna provide food. That woodpecker there is a sap sucker. It's drilling little holes into that into the tree there and sap will ooze out. And again, just like nectar, sap is kind of a sugar water solution. So the sap suckers will feed on it. Other birds will feed on it, including hummingbirds. Insects will feed on it. And I just think that's a neat way that our plants are providing food for wildlife in a way that we might not have ever thought about. 
Um, check out the bee in the middle there. Now she's on that flower, drinking flower nectar, but she's also gathering pollen. You can see her legs and her body are covered in that yellow pollen. Pollen is a food source, it's protein rich, and it's what bees actually feed their babies. So pollen is a food source too. Now, if you're an allergy sufferer like I am, um, and my eyes are going crazy right now because the pollen is just really bad right now, um, that probably doesn't make you happy. But I can say this, that flowers with big showy blooms, these are the ones that are providing pollen to the bees and other you know, pollinating wildlife. And those flowers are specifically designed to attract the wildlife to them. And their pollen grains are designed to stick to the bodies of those pollinators, not fly through the air. So showy blooms generally are not the kinds of flowers that are causing our seasonal allergies. It's wind pollinated plants that have very, very tiny pollen grains designed to blow in the wind. Things like grasses or pine trees or those oak trees you know, oaks are great, but they also do, do dump a lot of wind pollen out there. Um, those are causing your seasonal allergies for whatever that's worth. Um, but check out the last picture here, the one on the right. That is a, a Gulf fritillary caterpillar, beautiful butterfly, really kind of funky looking caterpillar. And yes, it is eating the foliage of the leaf of the plant. Now we talked about caterpillar host plants. In this case, one of the host plants for the fritillary is the passion vine flower uh, or a passion flower vine, is, it's also called. And so, yeah, some of your plants, the foliage is going to get eaten in a wildlife garden. And that flies in the face of conventional gardening, right, where we're taught, you know, spray it, squish it, get rid of it. You don't want anything eating the leaves of your plants. But that's very unnatural if you think about it. You know, these plants and these animals, again, co-evolve, they rely on each other. And, you know, the reality is, is that in nature, you know, you could go out to your favorite natural spot and look out at the landscape and probably never think to yourself, oh gosh, look at all the insect damage. But I guarantee you, if you look at any plant in any natural setting, you'll see all sorts of insect damage, right? So I guess what I'm saying is try to apply that perspective to your own garden space. And remember the fact that native plants and native wildlife, again, co-evolve and the native, plant, the native wildlife are not gonna kill the native plant. Yes, it might affect it aesthetically a little bit, but the idea that, you know, maybe your plant doesn't look so hot, but you're seeing these beautiful butterflies, right? It's a give and a take. So just try to apply that thinking to your garden space and, you know, you'll begin to kind of evolve a little bit maybe into this, this attitude of, you know, our gardens can actually be key components in supporting wildlife. So I mentioned those caterpillars and those insects. So the plants are at the base of the food web, the sort of the first protein source at the uh, animal protein source uh, in that food web is, insects and other invertebrates. And they're really, really important as a food source for all sorts of other wildlife, notably all the beautiful songbirds uh, that you wanna attract to your yard. And, um, and you know, everything eats insects. Insects eat other insects, spiders eat insects, the songbirds and other birds eat insects, the reptiles and amphibians eat insects. So mammals even eat insects. I mentioned the, the red fox, they, they eat bugs, um, but lots of animals eat insects. So without, a healthy insect population. Again, that food web comes to a little bit of a grinding halt. And so just to illustrate how important insects are for birds, keep this in mind, 96% of our backyard birds, you know, all upland terrestrial birds, so like not seabirds or waterfowl, pretty much everything else, 96% of those birds feed their babies invertebrates as a key part of their diet. So without bugs, you don't have birds. It's just as simple as that. And I included not just the bluebird there feeding the, the grasshopper, but the hummingbird. You know, people think hummingbirds only drink flower nectar, but the reality is, is that they're eating a lot of insects too. They need that protein. And they are catching these little tiny flying, you know, flies and gnats and midges and, and mosquitoes, believe it or not, on the wing and eating them and feeding them to their babies. So again, if you wanna have birds, you need bugs. And just to illustrate that, this is more of Dr. Doug Tallamy's research. They looked at Carolina chickadees and, and discovered that in order for one pair of Carolina chickadees to successfully raise one brood of young over the course of, um, I think it's like a 16 day nesting period, they had to catch between six and 9,000 insects just to successfully raise one nest of babies, right? So it takes a tremendous amount of, of insect biomass to produce even just one nest of birds. And by the way, those two chickadees really only hunt for those, those, those insects or invertebrates to feed their babies within about 150 feet of the nest. So folks, this is wildlife habitat and wildlife conservation on the scale of your yard. You know, your plant choice here becomes critical. Again, think if you had a choice and you planted the ginkgo and not the oak, this, this pair of chickadees would not be able to nest in your yard probably. So plant choice is really powerful. And when we pick the native plants, we know 
that they're going to be supporting more insects and therefore more birds and you know have a more robust food web and therefore a better healthier ecosystem and ultimately that's what this is all about even your dead plants are a food source for wildlife. That we joke at the National Wildlife Federation and say dead trees are full of life. So here is a pileated woodpecker looking for carpenter ants and beetle larvae and termites and things that burrow into dead and dying trees. So if you can keep your, your, your dead or dying tree standing or let it fall and let it be a log on the ground, you know that's gonna go a long way in providing a food source, not only for birds, but all sorts of other wildlife. So plants are the core of how you're gonna feed wildlife. Now, again, the food web go goes on and up. After the plants, it's the insects. And then after the, the insects, it's the smaller animals, right? And I know this can be a little bit tough to look at because we don't like to watch you know, sort of pred predation and action. But like I was saying before, predators are normal and natural. And I think it's important to acknowledge that they exist. So, you know, the frog gets eaten by the snake. The snake gets eaten by the owls. You know, the, the, the mouse gets eaten by the weasel. And this is happening outside or it could be and should be if we have developed the right kind of, of habitat gardens. And this is, you know, the, the more we have of this, the healthier the ecosystem is. So I just, I wanted to show that. All right, so real quick, we'll go back to feeders just for a second because bird feeding is very popular. And like I said, nothing wrong with feeding the birds. There's all sorts of different kinds of feeders out there, suet feeders, seed feeders, nectar feeders. Here are just my tips on bird feeding if you're gonna have them. Number one, you don't need them, but you know, in many ways, bird feeders are, I think kind of more for us because they attract the birds to one spot every day so that we can see and enjoy them. But you know, plant your native plants, create that food web, and then you can supplement that with, with some bird feeders. But key is don't overdo it. Don't have too many feeders. That can cause crowding and disease and stress. Um, and speaking of disease, the other key thing is that you have to keep your feeders sanitized. Um, there was, you know, recent outbreaks of salmonella with bird feeders. And so you really just want to be careful. So when the, the birds empty the feeder, you need to just take it down, bring it inside, scrub it, wash it, hot soap and water. Some feeders you can put right in the dishwasher. That will just help minimize any chances of your feeders spreading disease. You know, with those nectar feeders for hummingbirds and orioles, that sugar water that you put in there spoils quickly, like in hot weather, like a couple days, and then it's gonna start getting mold and bacteria and everything. You need to dump it, clean the feeder and put it back out to avoid harming the bird. So, you know, with feeders, just it's about, you know, the good quality ones and you wanna keep them, you know, well-maintained. If this fellow is showing up at your bird feeders, and, and I often get calls from people in a panic saying, a hawk is, is at my bird feeder, you know, hunting all my birds, what do I do? And I remind people that hawks are birds too, right? And they need to eat and survive and feed their babies. And you know, the reality is, is that when you put out a seed feeder for birds that eat seeds, you're also putting out a feeder for birds that eat, for birds, that eat birds. And animals like the sharp-shinned hawk or the cooper's hawk and other birds of prey, they naturally feed on songbirds. So you know, I know it can be traumatic to see uh, you know, your favorite songbird get caught by a hawk and eaten, but you know, if, you, if you don't want that to happen, here's what's happening. You're putting the feeders out. And like I said, the smaller birds are coming to that same spot every day in great numbers. Well, the hawks are noticing that. And they, of course, are just going to take advantage of it as a food source for themselves. So if you really don't want to see that ever from happening, you know, take your feeders down. If you have native plants everywhere, those little birds are going to have plenty to eat. They're just not going to congregate in one spot. That makes them a little bit easier for predators to catch. So that's just something to keep in mind with bird feeders. Um, this is not what we are talking about when we're talking about providing food for wildlife. So please don't do this. Unlike birds, mammals do tend to become habituated, and that means they lose their natural fear of us and they start depending upon us for food, you know, if you artificially feed them like this. And they stop, again, eating their natural foods that can cause health problems. And, you know, we have a saying like a dead mammal or a, a, a fed mammal is a dead mammal. And really what you're looking at in this picture is as cute as it is ultimately probably a bunch of dead baby raccoons because this might be fine for you to do in your backyard, put out a bowl of cat food or something and see the baby raccoons come and eat. But what you just taught them is that humans are a source of food. Humans are your friends. And then they're gonna walk down to your neighbor's yard or the local school grounds and someone's gonna call animal control and that'll be the end of that raccoon. So try to resist doing this. It really is unhealthy for mammals and it causes them to change their natural behavior. Again, if you plant lots of native plants, you'll build a food web, these animals will have everything they need to survive and they'll remain wild wildlife. They won't be treated like pets. Um, and again, that usually doesn't end well for the wildlife when we do that. 
if these guys are visiting your bird feeders, you need to take them down. You're not going to convince Black Bear that uh, this feeder was not put there for them and, you know, for their safety and ours. You really, you know, you can't have bears coming to your bird feeder. So, you know, take them down. If you really still want to feed the birds, wait for the bears to go down for their winter dormancy and you can put them back out. So just a few words on feeders there. Now, the rule, the exception to the rule with the mammals, uh, feeding mammals is this fellow here. This is this, a gray squirrel. You know, if you do have bird feeders, you know that no matter what you do, squirrels are going to get into them. Not the end of the world. You know, uh, it's... It, it, Squirrels are gonna do what squirrels do. My best advice is, you know, maybe get a squirrel proof feeder and then let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> I mean, these are not animals known for their smarts, but yet somehow they always figure out a way to foil the bird feeder or our attempts to keep them out of the bird feeder. So, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, let them have some seed, it's not the end of the world. All right, so that's food, really is all about your plants. So let's talk about the second component of habitat, which is water. And the, the next few of these habitat components are a little bit simpler and more straightforward. So water, right? Animals need water to drink, birds need water to bathe. So it's, a, it's kind of a critical resource that wildlife need as part of their habitat. Some animals actually live in the water. You know, aquatic animals like this green frog, they need pond ecosystems in order to really survive. So you'll see with food, water, cover, and places to raise young, there's some overlap between these things, right? Um, and so, so, but, at the end of the day, all wildlife need water in some way, shape, or form. Now, you might be adjacent to a large natural body of water or have a pond like this in your yard. This is my mom and dad's old, old place in, uh, in New Jersey. And you'll notice that the grass is not, is not mown all the way down to the banks of this natural body of water. If you do have a pond like this, you wanna make sure you keep that vegetative buffer. That keeps pollutants from running off into the water and it's also wildlife habitat. All of that emergent wetland vegetation there, those cattails and other things, that's hiding places, that's cover, that's food for all sorts of wildlife. And a water feature like this, you know, you might attract wading birds or waterfowl or aquatic turtles, um, things like that. And so that's a whole batch of wildlife that can benefit from this kind of water source. But most people don't have space for that, right? So more likely, if you're going to provide any kind of pond, it's going to be a smaller water garden like this. And this is my old backyard in Washington, D.C. Now, this is just one of those plastic pond liners that you can get, you know, at home improvement stores or whatever, or your garden center. Um, but importantly, you'll notice how heavily I have it planted. Not only are those plants competing with the algae for sunlight and nutrients so that I keep the water kind of clear and, and not turning into pea soup, those, those, that those plants are um, natural ladders in and out of the water. You know, even aquatic wildlife like frogs that get in could, could actually drown if they can't get out because these ponds have these steep sides and the overhang of rocks and everything. And I actually had, saw a fledgling bird fall in here and was able to climb right out just by hopping up onto the vegetation. And if I didn't have it well planted like that, that bird probably would have drowned. So, you know, make sure you plant your water gardens heavily. Um, keep That keeps them clean, gives those ladders in and out. And of course, the plants themselves are food resources. So in this pond, I've got that water lily there that was um, att attracted all sorts of little native bees. The two plants in the in the back, the taller ones, one of them is a is a native iris. The other one is a native pickerel weed, which is a great pollinator plant as well. So um, so if you have a water garden like this, you know just plant it, and that can be a great resource for all sorts of uh, wildlife. But honestly, you don't need to have a big pond or even a water garden. A simple bird bath will do. Right? The idea is not that you have to, again, provide water for every single animal out there. As long as you have some water for some kinds of wildlife, it kind of counts towards this idea of creating uh, a sustainable habitat. And so, you know, bird bath is, can be any shallow dish. You can have it on a pedestal. You can hang it from a chain from a tree branch. Um, you can attach it to your deck railing. Um, and, and, you know, you can even put it just straight on the ground. And animals that can't fly or climb would be able to use it as well as the birds. Um, and so, you know, just anything less than three inches, anything deeper than that, and the small birds won't use it. And it's as simple as that, you know, water, water provided. So, um, I, you know, everybody can do that, right? It's not that difficult. You can add things like fountains or drippers or sprayers that make the sound of running water, which is kind of attractive. Um, and you can do that, you know, to a bird bath or a pond or something like that. You saw in my backyard pond, I had a little waterfall feature that made that sound of running water. Uh, you don't have to, but you know, that can enhance its attractiveness. And you know, it's not just for those little backyard songbirds. This is a, in a certified wildlife habitat garden down in Florida. These are two barred owls. And the homeowner just, you know, looked out one evening and these owls were waking up for their evening, you know, e evening bath. And <laughs> they came down to the bird bath. 
So, you know, all sorts of wildlife will, will potentially use it, not just those little songbirds, like amphibians. You know, many amphibians, um, you know, they want to keep their skin moist. So the gray tree frogs, spring peepers, all sorts of other amphibians might actually utilize a bird bath. Again, if you put that on the ground, you know, toads and things that can't climb would be able to use it as well. So bird baths, not just for birds. Even insects can use water. And, you know, insects don't like to go to bigger bodies of water because if they fall in, they can get trapped by the surface tension and drown. So, you know, here's a tip. You can fill a bird bath with pebbles and that gives the, the insects a landing place so they can get a drink. And if they do fall in, they can usually pretty easily crawl out. Even a mud puddle can be an important water feature for wildlife. Those, those tiger swallowtail butterflies are actually engaging in a behavior called puddling, where they drink up muddy water from a, like a muddy patch on the ground. And that water has all sorts of dissolved minerals in it from the soil. And that's actually important nutrients that those butterflies need. And you know, birds aren't picky. They're happy to get a drink and take a bath in a puddle on the ground as they would be out of a bird bath, right? So if you have that spot in your yard that maybe is a little soggy and you can't get grass to grow and you're thinking about spending a ton of money putting in drains and filled soil and retaining walls, you know, maybe you just go with the flow of what mother nature provided and instead plant some native wetland plants and leave a little patch of mud and it can become a really important water feature for wildlife. Let's talk about mosquitoes just for a second. So with water come mosquitoes. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in water, they have an aquatic larval phase, and then they emerge and the females will try to bite and get a blood meal when they're getting ready to lay eggs. Interestingly, you might not know this, it's only the females that drink blood and it's only when they want to lay eggs. Otherwise, mosquitoes feed on flower nectar and they are pollinators. Now, luckily, they're not um, critically important pollinators in that there's not many plants in the world that are reliant on mosquitoes. There are some that, that you know, mosquitoes are a significant pollinator of, but, uh, but you know, I, I don't expect you to love mosquitoes and I'm under no delusions that you're going to, you know, appreciate them. But I think it's important, you know, again, to, to understand nature. So they are pollinators. But at any rate, you want to try to eliminate any breeding spots for mosquitoes. And so, you want to look at places like your gutters, which oftentimes can have little pools of water in them. You know, some leaves get in there. That can be a breeding spot for mosquitoes. Anywhere on your property that you have at least an inch of standing water, mosquitoes can be breeding there. So try to drain those. That's going to go a long way into reducing the mosquito population. Now, in terms of your wildlife water feature, bird baths, you just dump them out every couple of days. It takes the mosquito larva three to five days, or I'm sorry, five to seven days for most species in most conditions to go through that aquatic larval phase. So if you dump your bird bath out every two or three days, you're getting rid of all of any, any mosquito eggs or larva that might be in there. Now, if you have a pond or a water garden, you know, things like installing, again, a, a, a pump and have a little waterfall action going on, anything that moves the surface of the water, that will minimize mosquitoes' ability to lay eggs on that water. They like standing stagnant water, not moving water. You can also use something that is considered kind of an organic pest control. It's called BT, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a natural soil bacterium that we've learned can be, will actually be toxic to certain groups of insects. And one of the reasons why it's considered kind of, you know, an organic and natural pesticide is because it's targeted. It's not broad spectrum. It's not going to kill every bug out there. And there's different strains. So the strain for mosquitoes is Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, BTI. And they sell it as things called, products called mosquito dunks. They look like little donuts or as little bits called mos mosquito bits or mosquito granules. And basically you inoculate your water feature with them. The, the, the bacterium gets into the water, the mosquito larva ingest it and it kills them. But it's not harmful to anything else other than mosquitoes, fungus gnats, and a few other biting flies. So it's a pretty good solution if you really are worried about the mosquitoes. And also I think just practicing you know, good preventative measures. So, you know, wear insect repellent when you're outside. You can even just put a big fan out on your deck or your patio if you want to sit outside because mosquitoes are not particularly strong flyers and that can actually blow them away before they even get to you. So just something to think about to avoid broadcast spraying, broad spectrum pesticides everywhere, which I'm seeing more and more, which are definitely for sure killing the bees, killing butterflies, even if the companies tell you that they're not. So just deal with mosquitoes in that natural way and you won't have to do that. And just because it's cute. <laughs> Again, bird baths are not just for, for, for birds. These are two little bobcat kittens in a habitat in Arizona, just coming out for a drink and get their little feet wet. So that's food, that's water. The third component of habitat is cover. 
Now, this is really about the idea that animals need to get some shelter from the elements, you know, the heat, the wind, the cold, the rain. They want to hide out from, from that stuff. And also that this idea that animals need places to hide from predators, or if they're predators, need places to hide from prey. And the two animals that I'm showing you here are both of those. They're both, they're species that are both pre predators, but also prey for other animals. And notice where they're hanging out, the green and old lizard and the crab spider. They're hanging out on the vegetation. So the same plants that are, that are gonna provide food to wildlife are gonna do the bulk of the work when it comes to providing this element of cover, you know, hiding places for wildlife. And you, know, you can plant things like evergreens that are gonna provide cover year round. You can plant things that have thorns on them. That might be a little bit of extra protection for little animals that are hiding inside that vegetation. But ultimately cover really is largely about how you plant your garden, right? And the, the key message here is plant densely. Right. In nature, usually, you know, Mother Nature abhors a vacuum, they say. Right. And so there's usually a density of plants in any kind of ecosystem. So try to mimic that. And this is an important part to talk about kind of aesthetics of a wildlife garden. You know, there's this myth that if you're using native plants or, you know, you want to have a natural garden, that it's just it's just weeds. It's just going to be an overgrown mess. I don't know. This doesn't look like an overgrown mess to me. This looks like a, a picture of a beautiful garden out of a garden magazine. This is all native plants. And again, it, if you practice sort of good garden design where you're planting in big groups of plants and, 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 and you know, groupings of threes and fives of plants instead of just one individual plant plunked um, you know, in a row or whatever, you know, these create visually appealing gardens that also then if you plant densely like this provide a ton of cover for all sorts of small animals, insects, and even larger animals could be hiding out in there and, and staying safe. So, you know, with cover, it's largely about just planting densely and mimicking the way that Mother Nature plants. And you can do that in a way that is absolutely beautiful. It doesn't have to be, you know, kind of messy looking. And look, the reality is, is that there's a lot of bird or a lot of species out there that are just never going to visit a lawn, right? This is a wood thrush, one of those bird species that is rapidly declining because they like kind of woody kind of environments, you know, and so it's actually a good, another good tip to be thinking about when providing habitat and cover in particular to think vertically as well as horizontally, right? So wood thrushes, they're looking for, you know, not just one big canopy tree and a lawn, right? What they're looking for is that canopy tree that has understory trees underneath it, that under them have shrubby, you know, plants growing and then, you know, woodland wildflowers and ferns and then like a healthy leaf layer underneath all of that so they can forage for the insects that they eat. So, you know, especially if you have a small space, thinking vertically can actually be a real you know, uh, boon in providing the most amount of habitat because you can provide a lot if you go up with underplanting the big stuff with, with you know, understory trees and planting vines that will grow up fences and things like that. And you know, if we're gonna save birds like this wood thrush and hear their beautiful song, you know, we're gonna have to convert some of that kind of lawn and, and you know, tree plunked in the middle of it into something a little bit denser. Again, your dead plants are gonna be a great habitat value. So let that dead tree stand, let the log fall on the ground and become hollowed out. All sorts of animals will hide out in there. You know, you can build a brush pile with old, you know, debris wood. And, you know, these things really do become like wildlife hotels. I've seen all sorts of different animals inhabit them in different layers and levels. So that fallen woody debris, that is something that happens in nature, you know, can be replicated right in your own yard. Now, again, this might not be an aesthetic that you want or that your HOA wants, or if you live in a fire prone area, but the beauty is you don't have to do any one of these suggestions. Like you can apply food, water, cover, and places to raise young in a million different you know, ways, as long as you have those four elements represented, you know, so if you live in the city, how you do it might be a little bit different than you live in the country. Um, you know, if you, if you live again in a fire prone area, you probably don't want to have the brush pile, but maybe you'll do something different. So there's a lot of flexibility just by the very nature of these four components of habitat to make it work for anybody anywhere. And, you know, animals like this, this is the red eft, it's the juvenile phase of the Eastern newt. And these are just such cool animals. And the idea that they could be living with us right outside our doors, if we just give them fallen woody debris to hide under, that's what they need. You know, it's kind of spectacular to think about. And it goes so far beyond just the birds and the butterflies. And I mentioned that leaf litter before. Um, check out this picture. And, and can you see the animal in it? There's a little toad down on the bottom there. This is in the National Wildlife Federation's backyard in Virginia. And I happened to be just walking out there one day and spotted this toad. And it's a really great example of how the leaf litter layer is an important habitat and it prov provides tremendous amount of cover. You can see how this toad is perfectly camouflaged 
among the dead leaves. Yet, you know, as a society, we have been essentially kind of you know, brainwashed by the lawn and, and garden industry to every fall, rake up every last leaf, bag them up, send them to the landfill where they rot and cause methane gas that contributes to climate change when we could just leave them where they are. If you think about it, deciduous plants lose their leaves. They fall at the base of that, the trunk of the, the tree or the shrub where they protect the roots, they suppress weeds and they naturally break down and return their nutrients right to the root zone. Sounds an awful lot like, fer- like, like mulch and fertilizer, right? Yet we get rid of it all every year and then go out and spend money to buy more mulch and fertilizer. It's kind of insane if you think about it. It's even more insane when you realize that that leaf litter is providing cover for a gajillion different kinds of animals. So we were talking about moths before, like many, many moths overwinter in the leaf layer as pupa. So when you rake up all your leaves, you are eliminating all of the next generation of moths that could be producing the food sources that the birds are gonna need in the spring in the form of new caterpillars, right? So think about that. Now, yes, leaves are gonna smother your lawn. That is gonna happen if you just let them drop where they lie. To which I say, that's great. We should all have less lawn, right? Minimize the size of your lawn. Maybe turn a a little bit of your lawn this season into a bed where you plant some native wildflowers or a tree or a shrub. And then you can use that leaf litter as kind of a natural mulch. And, you know, the more that we can keep those leaves on site intact in that that whole leaf form, the more habitat and cover they're going to provide for wildlife. And sure, you can have fun with it too. You can add things like this little toad house or toad abode, like they're sometimes called. This is one we sell in the National Wildlife Federation shop site, which I'll tell you about at the end. But, you know, any little animal will will certainly use this as a place of cover. You know, it doesn't always have to be kind of like a raw natural, you know, element. It could be something that we make that has a little bit of a design element. And this also brings that human note into the landscape. So um, again, it kind of makes it, it communicates to people that this is a deliberate thing that I've done, even if it looks very different, my wildlife habitat garden does, than, than, than maybe your, you know, manicured lawn and ornamental shrubs. Another uh, kind of artificial mimicking of natural habitat that you can put out that will provide cover is something called a roosting box. Now, this is a kind of birdhouse that, um, you know, is designed for birds to hide in and, and in, you know, usually in bad weather or cold temperatures. And, you know, it's, they don't use it for nesting. That would be a nesting box. And so, you know, you can build and buy these as well. They're slightly different in design than, than nesting boxes. All right, last component of habitat is places to raise young. And again, you're going to see that there's a lot of overlap with some of these other ones, but no surprises, your native plants are going to do the majority of the work yet again. Same plants that are going to provide food, they're also going to provide cover, and they're also going to provide places to raise young, right? So where do birds nest? In trees, whether they build their nests in the branches like the hummingbird, where they just, you know, sort of utilize tree branch structures like the owls, where they're cavity nesters like woodpeckers that actually excavate holes that they and other cavity nesting birds will utilize as nesting spots. So how do you provide places to raise young for birds? Plant more trees and shrubs, keep your mature trees and shrubs. If you can, don't cut them all down. Work to protect wooded areas or you know, trees and shrubs in your town and community and birds will have plenty of nesting habitat. But other animals need that vegetation too, specifically when they're babies. So this is, again, you know, kind of where cover and places to raise young maybe overlap a little bit. But many mammal species need vegetation to hide their babies. We are in baby deer season and baby rabbit season. And deer moms and bunny and rabbit moms leave their babies alone hidden in the vegetation. A lot of times people think they're orphaned or abandoned. No, they're just leaving them there hidden in the vegetation so that they aren't, they don't uh, attract predators to them until the babies are a little bit bigger and can kind of run around and escape on their own. So, you know, without that, that sort of ground level dense vegetation, a lot of animals in their juvenile phase couldn't survive. This painted turtle too, that adorable little turtle, it's an aquatic species, but they lay their eggs on land. And so if that little guy doesn't have adequate cover in the form of vegetation to get from where his mom laid the eggs last summer, you know, to, to where he hatched and is now climbing to get into the pond, you know, he's going to be an easy prey for any, any number of predators. So we want to give him just enough cover so that he can get down there and, you know, keep the species going. So, you know, you can also supplement some of that nesting habitat for birds by putting out a, a birdhouse or more accurately, a nesting box because birds don't really live in them year round. And there's any number of different species, cavity nesters that will utilize this sort of artificial 
natural, you know, artificial cavity that mimics the natural cavities in trees that they would otherwise use. Um, some pro tips for, for these nesting boxes. A lot of the ones you find on the marketplace are not that good. They're not made properly. They are not made of good materials. So just, you wanna be careful. I always recommend going with something simple and natural, you know, plain wood. It can be painted or stained on the outside, but should be raw wood on the inside. Good nesting boxes should have ventilation at the top, drainage at the bottom, should never have a perch on them. Native birds don't need a perch. You can see that little wren there. You know, the wren does not need a perch to get into that box. The, all the perch does is give like raccoons an easy handle to grab onto it and pluck out the baby birds. And again, predation is normal and natural, but it's general best practice if you're putting out a nesting box is you wanna protect the birds because you've lured them in to have their babies there and you don't want them to you know, just immediately have the babies get eaten. So, um, you know, do your research. I cover a lot of this in my book, which I'll tell you about. And the National Wildlife Federation, again, carries several really good nesting boxes that you can buy from our shop site. And you know what? Look, this is another example of why this is real conservation. Eastern bluebirds were really declining across the country by the middle of the last century because we had cut down a lot of the old trees as suburbia, you know, really expanded. And the, the species was looking to be in real trouble, but in part because of the efforts to put out bluebird nesting boxes, we kind of stabilized the population and now they're actually doing okay. So again, this is real wildlife conservation. It's just happening not in the, you know, the national parks or wilderness areas, it's happening in your own neighborhood and you made it happen. So it's not just birds and mammals and reptiles that need nesting places, insects need places to raise young too. And this is a bee, but it's not a bee that forms a hive. It's not a bee that has queens or sisters or anything like that, or makes honey. And the reality is, is that most bee species, most of the 20,000 bee species on the planet, 4,000 of which are found in North America, are solitary bees, right? And so it's one individual female bee nesting in a tunnel, and she's gonna lay an egg, give it a little ball of nectar and pollen, and build a chamber wall and fill the tunnel. And then, and once she's done, she leaves. She doesn't care for the baby, she doesn't defend them, so therefore she's not very likely to try to sting unless you grab her in your hand. And, um, and so these bees need nesting places. So there's not much that you can do to actually provide nesting for these ground nesting bees, which again are the majority of, of a bee species on this planet. But if you do see a bee coming in and out of the tunnel, please don't spray it or squash it. Let, it do, let her do her business um, and, and you'll be really supporting that local bee population. Um, so you know, of these solitary bees, probably about two thirds of them, three quarters of them are nesting in the ground. The other uh, you know, third to quarter of them are nesting in little tunnels in dead and dying wood. So think about that dead tree, that fallen log, that brush pile, all those little uh, cavities and tunnels that, that termites drilled or that woodpeckers drilled in that dead wood. That is where the other uh, solitary bees are making their nests. That, those, those woody, dead plant materials or herbaceous plant stems. So how you can provide habitat, nesting habitat for those kinds of bees is again, leave the, leave the dead and dying trees, but also don't cut your perennial stems down to the ground in the fall. You know, again, conventional gardening says tidy everything up, cut everything down, you know, heavily mulch. If you resist doing that and leave those stalks standing, not only do the seed heads provide an important food source for birds throughout the winter, but likely inside of those stems, you'll have all sorts of native bee larva uh, or pupa waiting out the winter. And then at this time of the year, they'll chew themselves out and fly away. So try to keep at least a foot of those, those stems standing. Um, you know, you can cut them back in the late spring, early or late winter, early spring to maybe a foot. And then that'll leave at least some stems for the bees that are in them to emerge and also nesting spots for them when they mate. And, you know, the new green growth that is emerging will rapidly overtake that. So aesthetically, you know, it'll be covered pretty quickly, but that's something that we can all do, at least with some of our, 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 our perennial plants is leave those stems standing. You can put out bee nesting houses. These mimic the natural tubes or tunnels that those um, plant nesting native bees will use. Things like orchard mason bees or leaf cutter bees. The only thing with this is that, you know, you're concentrating the nesting uh, much more densely than they, these bees would nest in nature. And what we're finding is that these bee nesting houses, a lot of times 
get riddled with parasites, which actually can reduce the bee population. So if you're going to do this, what you really should do is be harvesting the little bee pupa cocoons, storing them in a refrigerator over the winter, and then putting them back out at this time of year with fresh tubes. And that's a lot of work. So if you don't want to do that, totally fine. You can still provide habitat for these bees in those other ways. You don't have to have a bee nesting house. These bees and other wildlife use mud to build their nests. So yes, I did have a bowl of mud in my backyard. Um, and yeah, I planted flowers around it so it didn't look quite so strange. But yeah, the native bees would come gather mud and they use that to build the chamber wall in, in their nesting tunnel. And birds like robins and phoebes, by the way, also use mud. So that can be a way that you can provide a resource for places to raise young for those groups of animals. Uh, bats, we talk a lot about bat houses as cover, and they are, but if you are lucky, you might get a maternal colony of bats moving into your bat house and having their babies. So that's pretty fantastic. So some quick tips on bat houses. Number one, no guarantee they're actually gonna work. Um, bats want natural habitat, roosting in trees and dead and dying trees inside hollow trees, things like that. But you know, if you mimic that with a, with a bat house, you might just get lucky and attract them. Um, don't hang it on a tree, even though they naturally roost in trees. Bats generally don't use bat houses mounted on trees. Better yet to put it on the side of a building at least 12 to 15 feet off the ground. And it should be big. The bat house itself should be at least say two feet tall by about 18 to 20 inches wide and have multiple chambers. And you'll have more of a chance of attracting bats as a place to raise their young. And you know, some animals just have completely different habitat needs in different phases of their life cycle. So we've talked a lot about those caterpillars you know, that's, that eventually turn into butterflies and moths that drink flower nectar, but in caterpillar phase, they need those host plants. Without that host plant, the species can't complete its life cycle and their population plummets. Similarly, amphibians, even those tree frogs and toads, they start out life as aquatic tadpoles or salamander larva, even if they eventually become terrestrial. So, you know, those animals need those bigger bodies of standing water to reproduce it. So be thinking about the full life cycle of the animals so that we can provide complete habitat and really support their populations. All right, I mentioned monarchs. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but I think, you know, monarchs are in trouble. Their populations are plummeting. Um, they have this incredible migration where they migrate east of the Rockies all the way down to Mexico, and then they do the return journey, which there is happening right now, over the course of four or five generations, you know, it's one of the natural wonders of the world, frankly. This doesn't happen anywhere else. And unfortunately, monarch butterflies are disappearing. The Eastern population numbers, you don't have to look at the details, but just look at the trajectory here, right? This is the most recent numbers. They're way down from where they're, they were in their population highs in the 90s and in real trouble. The Western population west of the Rockies, even worse. There's less than 1% left of that population. And it's because we've gotten rid of the plants that they need to survive, specifically their caterpillar host plant, which is milkweed. Milkweed is the only thing that monarchs can eat. And because milkweed has weed in the name, it has a PR problem. And so the garden industry hasn't embraced it. And in agricultural lands, it is considered a weed and you know it gets nuked with pesticides and it goes away and so do the monarchs. At the same time, the adult butterflies need nectar especially to fuel their migration. And so the less native nectar plants are out there, the less that they have to survive in that phase of life. And so as a result, their populations are plummeting. But I'm here to tell you that if we all planted more blooming native plants and at least some milkweed in our yards, we could exponentially increase the habitat for monarch butterflies. And if we all do that over time, we have a chance of turning the, this population trend around for this really fascinating, unique wildlife species that again can coexist with us right outside our window. So plant milkweed. Milkweed, there's over 90 species that are native to North America and many of them are beautiful. The ones that are found in New Hampshire are things like the swamp milkweed, the butterfly weed. Um, and so, you know, these are just a few examples of some of the different milkweeds that we have around the country. So try to seek that out from your local nursery, your local native plant nursery and plant it. All right, so the last thing then is just this. You've created food, water, cover, and places to raise young. You've got all this wildlife visiting your yard and you know, raising their next generation there and everything's great. But then you turn around and you spray pesticides everywhere. Kind of defeats the purpose, right? So a key component here is that you just commit to kind of naturally um, maintaining your yard and, 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 and kind of engaging in garden practices that minimize any negative impact that you could be having on the environment. So real quick to just run through a few ideas. Conserve water. A massive amount of our municipal water every year goes to watering lawns. And quite frankly, that's a waste. So, you know, reduce the size of your lawn, plant more natives that don't need supplemental watering, 
store water in a rain barrel for watering your garden. These are all things that we can all do to conserve our natural resources, which is water. This is a big one, folks. We got to keep our cats indoors. Um, you know, cats are wonderful pets. I, you know, love cats, but they are natural predators and we human beings have introduced them and supported their populations in mass numbers and the native wildlife can't handle it. Domesticated cats that are allowed to roam free, either our pets or stray or feral cats, kill between one and four billion songbirds every year and up to 20 billion mammals. And this is based on multiple studies. Like this isn't just out of thin air, right? These are studies that have shown this huge massive negative impact that free roaming domesticated cats are having on wildlife. No one's even studied yet their impact on reptiles, amphibians, insects, right? So again, not the cat's fault. Cats aren't evil, they're natural predators, right? But they're an extension of the negative impact that we human beings are having, right? So it's up to us to minimize that and fix it. And I know it can be hard to turn an outdoor cat into an indoor cat, you know, but maybe if you can't do that, then maybe just commit to your next cat, you know, keeping it and raising it as an indoor cat. And, you know, indoor cats can be perfectly happy and fulfilled. They don't need to go outside. And honestly, they live to be about twice as long than outdoor cats. So it's better for cats, better for birds and other wildlife. So we should all try to do that. Another big thing is, you know, the pesticides, right? So, you know, insecticides kill the butterflies and the bees. Herbicides kill all the native plants. So try to avoid spraying pesticides. In most cases in a home and garden scenario, they're just not necessary. Um, you know, rely on natural predators. The, this caterpillar is has been parasitized by a wasp, a, a braconid wasp. And those, those little white things are the egg cases. They're gonna hatch and feed on that caterpillar from the inside out and then emerge into more wasps that are hunting more caterpillars and keeping their populations in check. So, you know, if you spray pesticides, you kill the wasps as well as the caterpillar, right? And then that's not, that's not uh, natural gardening, if you will. The other big killer of birds after cats are our windows. So try to minimize reflections on your windows wherever possible. This is a little woodpecker that hit my window last year. Um, and so now I have a screen on the outside of that window where the reflection was and that cuts it down. You know, you can use shades on the inside. You can put decals. You have to put a lot of them over your window. During bird migrations, try to keep lights out, especially in cities. Birds fly at night on their migrations and they oftentimes get disoriented by urban light pollution and, you know, hit the sides of buildings and go off course and things like that. So um, that's something we can all commit to doing as well. Um, you can use sustainable products. This is a birdhouse made out of recycled plastic, another way of, you know, just kind of having a sustainable garden. So food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable gardening. That's what you need to do to create a wildlife habitat. So to finish here, this is what I see all across the country. This is the standard. This is the goal for what the American landscape should look like. And frankly, when I see this, it makes me sad. It kind of makes me angry. This is dead. This doesn't support life, right? You've got this giant massive lawn sucking up water and reliant on pesticides and fertilizers and a handful of, you know, kind of the same ornamental plants that support nothing that are planted from east coast to west coast, north to south, right? But if everybody shifted their, their kind of vision of what the perfect yard could look like from something like this, you know, and not everybody obviously has a yard this big, but you get the, the principle here, right? If we shifted from this, to something like this. You know, there's still lawn, lawn's the people habitat. That's where you kick the ball around with the kids and the dogs can romp and, you know, you can have your picnic. But if we all added a few beds of blooming native plants and trees and shrubs, you know, you that are gonna provide the food, water, cover and places to raise young, you know, you throw the bird bath that provides the water and we have a little functioning habitat. And again, when I do it and you do it and the neighbors do it, that adds up to exponential amounts of habitat. And we could still have neat and beautiful yards that also support wildlife. So this is what we're hoping to do at the National Wildlife Federation is inspire more landscapes like this. You can do this anywhere, not just in a suburban yard. You can do this in the middle of the city in a container garden or a rooftop garden or a community garden. You can do it at your kids or your grandkids school. You can do it at your office. You can do it at the local library. Anywhere where you can plant stuff, you can create a wildlife habitat garden. And any garden anywhere that meets those requirements is eligible 
for the certification for the certified wildlife habitat status. And as I mentioned at the top, this is just our recognition program, right? It's not blue ribbon. You don't have to have the perfect yard. I'm not going to come with a clipboard and judge you. Um, you know, it's on our system. We've got an online form. You fill it out. It goes through all of those components of habitat. And if you have the basics, you're eligible to kind of join this growing community that we started all the way back in 1973 at the National Wildlife Federation. And, you know, a lot of people like to get that recognition. But, you know, the ultimate point is planting the wildlife garden. You don't have to get certified. When you do, though, you can, again, post the yard sign. We've got a couple different kinds of signs depending on your aesthetics. You get a personalized certificate, you become a National Wildlife Federation member, you get a subscription to National Wildlife Magazine, you get a 10% discount to our shop site. So lots of little perks that go along with it. And as I mentioned, it's Garden for Wildlife Month, so we're really trying to get a lot of people to do it this month. So here are the resources. Go to our website, nwf.org garden. Lots more information on everything we talked about. Um, we've got a, this is where you go to certify. We've got a fantastic tool here called the Native Plant Finder. You can put your zip code in and we'll give you a list of the top ranked native plants that are gonna serve as caterpillar host plants. So these are the plants that are gonna support the most numbers of butterflies and moths as their caterpillar host plant. And therefore also support the birds because again, 96% of our backyard birds are relying on insects, mostly caterpillars, to feed their babies. So this is down to a science to your zip code. Um, and again, this is based on the work of Dr. Doug Tallamy, if you're familiar with him. Really exciting. We just launched this whole new initiative at the National Wildlife Federation, where we're actually going to be providing a curated uh, list or a curated package of native plants, native to your region, that we have picked to provide three seasons of bloom, to support the most numbers of native bees and butterflies as caterpillar host plants, and are gonna look beautiful and functional in your yard. We, you know, a lot of people, you know, have reached out to us over the years saying, I don't, I don't know what plants to plant, I don't know where to get them. So this is a brand new initiative that we're hoping is gonna you know, blow up and be huge. Right now it's only available in 20 states, uh, New Hampshire included. So you guys are lucky you can be part of this pilot group. But if you're interested, um, the website is gardenforwildlife.org. Again, it's a curated line of native plants. Um, it's beautiful and free shipping, sustainable packaging, all that good stuff. So definitely check that out as well. This is just a sample of some of the different plant collections that we have. You can get them in six packs or 12 packs. Again, we do all the work. We get garden designs and a lot of supplemental materials. And um, you know, really excited about this. We're hoping it's gonna be a big deal. This is what the box looks like when it shows up in your house, plant with a purpose. So it's gardenforwildlife.org. I mentioned our shop site a couple of times. This is our, our shopnwf.org site. We have a whole garden for wildlife shop there where you can buy bird baths and nesting boxes and other backyard habitat resources. And again, with all of this stuff, the plant sales, the shopnwf.org, all of the proceeds support the wildlife conservation work of the National Wildlife Federation. So if you're on social media, follow us at Garden for Wildlife. We're on Facebook and Twitter. We just started an Instagram and a Pinterest for Garden for Wildlife. I'm on all of these social media sites as well. So David Mizajewski or naturalist David Mizajewski, you can kind of hunt me out there. And, you know, again, great way to ask follow-up questions if you have them. And lastly, I have a book. It's called Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and other backyard wildlife. It's a simple how-to book. You know, beginners can pick it up and not be overwhelmed, but I think more experienced folks, I think will learn a few things and get some new ideas as well. It's got plant list, projects, step-by-step -step projects, um, illustrations, and over 200 full-color photos that I picked specifically to inspire you to make a wildlife habitat garden. So you can get this at Booksellers Anywhere. You can get it on our shop site. Um, and again, all the proceeds support the work of the National Wildlife Federation. So thank you for sticking with me. I know I went a little long, but um, oh, this is that Garden for Wildlife Month promotion again. So if again, if you want to certify your garden space during the month of May and actually all the way through to the end of June, go to this website, use that code, and we'll be sharing that on all of our social media as well. So I'm gonna stop there and see if we can get to some of your questions. Awesome, thank you so much, David. I, I think uh, I hear the standing ovation and I really appreciated uh, being right alongside you the whole time. Um, just learning from you and really embracing that vision that you have um, for backyard habitat. Um, we, do, we do have uh, enough time for maybe just one of the questions, but okay. I do want to mention that you guys, snakes got a lot of love 
on Facebook Live, like multiple people are like, yeah, snakes are awesome. They're super important. Um, but the one that is, I think, most interesting uh, question that someone asked on Facebook um, was, most of my neighbors have lawns and use pesticides and herbicides. How do you educate neighbors about sustainable gardening? And like, how do you bring people into the fold? Fantastic question. Um, you know, there's no there's no magic bullet to to answer that, right? So, I think it's a combination of things. So, one thing that I always encourage people to do is is try to remember if you are trying to create a natural landscape, um, that you're an ambassador for this idea of natural gardening and wildlife habitat gardening. And you know, sometimes people in their in their earnestness to want to restore a natural habitat, you know, aesthetically create a garden that looks pretty wild, right? And then all the neighbors freak out and the HOA comes after you and you have, you know, the mob with the pitchforks and you're, you know, the crazy person on the corner with the weedy yard, right? And at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, is that really helping in the big picture, right? If you've now just turned off your entire neighborhood from natural mm -hmm. habitat gardening, right? So yeah. I think we need to be smart and we need to be savvy and think about, well, what's going to sell this idea to my neighbors? So first I would say, especially for front yards, it's okay to have something a little bit more neat and a little bit more in line aesthetically with your neighbors. At a minimum, if you're using the right native plants, you're still gonna be providing the habitat for wildlife. You can still plant densely and have it look neat and beautiful and tidy, right? It doesn't have to be a wild mess. And quite frankly, in my opinion, when you just let things grow and don't really maintain and keep on top of it, usually you just end up with a garden filled with non-native invasive plants. And that's not good for wildlife either. Right. Yeah. So think about it from that point of view. How can I create a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing landscape? Right. And then invite your friends over. Right. Invite them over, your neighbors over, and they're going to see the hummingbird and they're going to be like, oh, my God, that's so cool. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, mm -hmm. slow. Right. This change doesn't happen overnight. I've been at the National Wildlife Federation talking about this and promoting it and trying to inspire people for 21 years, right? And in that time, I've seen a pretty radical shift, but we're still not there yet. We have a long way to go. And my other answer to that question is just this, get involved, right? Be, become an advocate. Get on your local you know, weed ordinance board or you know, get on your HOA board and talk to people about this and share some of this information. I'm quite happy to be booked to go speak to any of those groups and, and, and teach them this stuff, you know? I mean, so there's ways that you can kind of work within the system to change that. So, you know, be an ambassador, be a good neighbor. We do have resources about this, by the way, on the National Wildlife Federation website. We've got kind of a tip sheet that's called neighbor friendly uh, wildlife habitat gardening and things like that. So there are resources out there on how to develop better weed ordinances and HOA um, bylines and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but that's a really fantastic question. And I appreciate the, I, you know, just people thinking that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you need to showcase what works and really, I love that idea of inviting them in to showcase, you know, what it can be. Um, yeah, I see that we're 10 minutes over and I want to respect your time, David, and everyone else's time. So thank you so much again. Um, I just put a few links into the chat um, for anyone that's still watching. Um, feedback survey, ways to join our conservation family at uh, New Hampshire Audubon, our other series. Um, as well as the NWF uh, garden site that David Fantastic. And I, I want to give a shout out to New Hampshire Audubon. Um, the National Wildlife Federation is a true federation. We couldn't do the work that we do nationally if it wasn't for our boots on the ground state affiliates. And um, it really is a great big wildlife conservation family. And we really encourage everybody, if you're not already, to you know support the New Hampshire Audubon. Thank you so much, David. And, and another quick shout out to Diane DeLuca, our senior biologist, who's been instrumental in orchestrating this whole thing uh, and all the speakers, including uh, David for this evening. So thank you to Diane. Thank you for to David. Thank you for our funders for this um, talk, the New Hampshire Humanities Council. And um, thank you for, uh, for joining us this evening. And I uh, hope you all have a great night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>